So today we're going to talk about technology in a Montessori world. Obviously in a Montessori philosophy and in Montessori's curriculum there is no mention to technology as technology wasn't a thing back in the day. So what are your um, opinions on Montessori and how she would view today's technology? So when we look at technology in a Montessori environment, um, it is true she wasn't around, um, you know, when when technology was invented or the technology we know as, such as iPads or computers. <coughs> and it is a debate that happens within the the Montessori community globally um, about, you know, what is right, what is wrong, should it be in the classroom, you know, what is. It's a, it's a very hard topic um, and you really need to choose as a Montessori and you need to choose where you stand and what you believe in. Um, so in my research when it comes to the first six years of life and their ability to use technology, whether it's at home or in the classroom, it's really taking those Montessori principles of isolated concept, control of error um, and ensuring that when a child is interacting um, with these devices, um, or playing games and things like that, that we've taken those Montessori principles into consideration when choosing what type of apps um, or videos that they uh, are using. Um, I think that there is definitely um, a place for it. Um, and a lot of those who are zero to six at the moment, they are sort of technology natives. So they, it's like they're born and they just know how to check the photo on a phone um, when they're scrolling, um, which is, which is, you know, comes from modeling um, the adult in the environment, they're watching and observing, and so they're able to do those things. So I think technology is a, um, an opportunity to extend and deepen learning um, and understanding of certain concepts um, or ideas. But I do believe when you're looking at apps to really have ones where the child is involved in the constructing or creating the environment that they might be in. Maria Montessori comes from a constructivist theory um, angle with the way she views education. So um, I would I would feel the same when it's looking at apps. So there are ones, you know, Minecraft is one, for instance, there they have a creative element of it. You don't have to have what you don't have to just play Minecraft against other people that you might feel unsafe uh, for your zero to six year old child to interact with people you might not know. Um, but the creative element of Minecraft can be really, really uh, beneficial for a child uh, and can incorporate science, mathematics, and a lot of the cultural curriculum that, that you can find in a cycle one or cycle two environment in a Montessori classroom. Um, so it's really analyzing uh, what children are choosing. Um, you know, what, what is your child asking for? Um, and it can get harder as you have younger siblings and older siblings in the same space, especially at home. Um, to uh, control what they have access to. Uh, so I think when you are looking at the time that your child spends on an iPad, um, it's really, are you doing it for the benefit of the child or are you doing it for the benefit of you as an adult? Um, it makes parenting easier. Uh, and that's very, very evident in the amount of time and places that we see children having access to screens. Um, I definitely am somebody who has used screens since my child was born, uh, but I do take a lot of what I understand about Montessori into the decision making um, with the content that they are exposed to um, through those platforms. Uh, so I think you need to know, you need to trust your own gut instinct as a parent and you need to make decisions on what you believe in. It can be really overwhelming when you start looking um, at how or what to do um, when you when you have no, I guess, foundation to start from. Whereas I've been in Montessori for a number of years now, that has allowed me to make what I think is, is better decisions or informed choices. Uh, so in Australia, um, Dr. Christy Goodwin would be a leader in this space of digital uh, technology and wellbeing for children zero to 12. Um, so her Facebook page, her, um, her website, she has a number of courses online you can do as a parent or educator. Uh, but I think she is a very, she's an amazing speaker if she's at an event near you. Um, but her content can help you guide yourself, whether you're a Montessori parent or not, uh, in making those informed decisions. Um, as an educator, 
choosing how you're going to use technology in the classroom can be really um, overwhelming and difficult, especially if you're a Montessori educator, because there is so much to, um, divisiveness um, in that space. Um, but ensuring that you know what your centre's values are, what your centre philosophy is, and how you're going to utilise and embed technology in your space uh, and making decisions around that. So uh, there are a number of uh, early childhood technology conferences that have been on over the years. Um, one of the best books I've ever found was this one, um, which is uh, Australian based, but it's technology and digital media in the early years. Um, and you can buy it online. Uh, it, it actually has a whole chapter on what would Maria Montessori do, uh, but it's, it really allows you to explore technology in the early year setting um, from a open lens and you're able to make a decision. It's not a dictation. They're not telling you exactly what you should be doing um, because we all know that research is, is still happening. And so those guidelines and ideas change as that research is conducted. So um, really trust in your own instinct, whether you're a parent or educator, and making decisions around that uh, when it comes to technology. So just to conclude, what are the key pieces of advice for, number one, a parent and um, trying to navigate around devices and screen time? And what are the key points of advice for the educators in, in their early years sector? Mm -hmm. um, so some key points um, for parents when it comes to devices and, and use with your child, whether there's uh, in the zero to six space, where I really am going to stay in the early years, um, is make choices on when a child has access to the device. Uh, so for instance, in my family, it's the weekends only. Um, and that has worked without tantrums and tears uh, because there's an expectation um, and it's consistent. Uh, so that consistency is key. Um, at times, uh, it has been pulled out if it's needed because an emergency meeting has come up, which is not, you know, uh, something that a child needs to engage in. Uh, so it might be something that's pulled out or for research. So there's a, a question that they might have that I have no idea. Um, and sometimes using, you know, hey, Google, um, is not going to give us the response that we want. So sometimes it needs to be used for things like that. But majority of the time, especially for play, um, it, is, it is the weekend. So being consistent in the choice and time um, of when the device is accessible. Um, also ensuring that the apps or um, videos or content that they have access to, you have put it through an, a filter of an adult. Uh, so YouTube Kids um, does, does allow for less advertising, uh, which can impact um, and be very influential on some children. Uh, on one, one of my children, it didn't matter, but on my youngest, advertising works for him. He just wants everything. Uh, so really being aware of, of what they've got access to and um, looking at it first before you give it to them. Um, those apps that you're choosing, ensuring that they align with your own personal philosophy as a parent, but also um, with whatever type of education that child has access to. Uh, so the pink tower on a Montessori app is not the same as the pink tower in a classroom. Uh, so really having a look at whether that's actually concrete enough, uh, or if we leave those Montessori type of apps out uh, so that they're getting the exposure to those materials and those names and those words when they're in the classroom. Um, also freedom, some level of freedom. And what I mean by that is I probably reference creativity more than anything. So choosing apps that they can create, that they can have a choice to. Um, one of the interesting things that has been by having the two different boys with the big age gap is um, one of them will watch something on YouTube, but then he will role play that or interact that into his concrete play. So um, especially around monster trucks and cars, um, or, you know, for instance, with dinosaurs and things like that. So there might be social situations that are in the thing that he is watching uh, and then he um, extends on that. So uh, being able to see that imagination at play has been really has been really cool, uh, considering my other my eldest child is quite concrete and not so much into imaginative play as the youngest. Um, so that has also helped me realign with what I believe with technology and children um, and that there are so many benefits of it. Uh, there's obviously also the negatives, um, 
but looking at it from a curiosity point of view and a what can, how can this help my child? How can this help their learning or deepen knowledge and understanding? Um, so they would be probably the, the, the first base level um, points and tips that I would have when it comes to technology and children from a parent's perspective. So um, from an educator's perspective and looking at um, iPads, children, screens, different type of devices, um, what are you trying to achieve as, as the teacher or the educator? What are you wanting the outcome to be? Um, is it that there is an investigation that you need to do and you need the research of the device because a child has asked a really interesting question? You might know the answer, but you know that this is an opportunity for them to explore their, their way to, uh, to get the end result. Um, so, you know, but there also might be set type of activities you want to do or introduction of concepts that um, technology can make um, a whole lot easier. Uh, so there are apps, for instance, you know, that you can uh, control the beat of a heart and it shows you how fast the blood cell, the blood moves through the heart. Um, and so if you're talking about the human body or you're having um, conversations about animals and the different places that they live, there are apps that can actually showcase things that you might not be able uh, to do. You're not particularly going to show a concrete heart, a real heart, um, you know, pumping blood through it, uh, but there are apps that can simul uh, simulate uh, the question that they have, which can really deepen that knowledge and then open and it, it basically explode the child's mind of where they could go with that type of uh, content. Um, so but just being aware of the same, the choices that you're making and what outcome you're actually wanting um, and then looking at ways in which you can incorporate that. Um, I don't believe in technology being put in front of children to distract them or to keep them in the same place for a period of time because it makes the adult's job easier. Uh, so in a lot of Montessori environments and especially in ones that um, wear across, you don't have TVs with Peppa Pig playing on them for an hour. Uh, just because that, um, you know, the children love it. Of course they love it. The music, it's designed to get the child's, um, the child's attention, um, but it has very little, if any at all, um, beneficial uh, impact on the child's development. Um, so I think there are ways in which technology is, is beneficial, but I also think it is abused by the adults in spaces that makes the adult's life easier rather than everything for the child. How would you go about um, advising the parent to digitally detox um, from, say, screen time for three hours a day down to just weekend time? Um, so if we're in a situation where your child is using the uh, using a device for a long period of time and you're wanting to bring that down to something that you feel is more controlled or more appropriate for that child's development, um, you need, you, it's not something, well, there's two ways you could go about it. You could do it progressively. You could go from a three hour, if they're on it for three hours and you're noticing that that's impacting their behavior and their overall mood, you might move that to two hours. Over a period of time, you might move that to one hour. But those type of changing those those boundaries and those limits is something that you need to communicate to your child. It's not something that one day you can just wake up and say, oh no, you can't have the iPad today. If they've consistently had it for three hours every day for the last three weeks, you are that is not fair on that child. Understanding that there are freedom within limits, that those boundaries and things that sometimes life, it has to change. Um, but explaining that to them, the why behind it before doing those things is really important um, for the respect of, for having the respect for your child. Um, some, if it is, if it is, um, if it's very, if it's impacting your child very negatively, then it might be a case of just stripping it completely. Um, but you have to, whatever decision you're making and whatever limits you're changing, you need to be consistent in that. It's not something that because you're in a mood today as the adult, you're just taking it away because your child's behaving negatively. But then in two weeks time or two days time or two hours time, you're tired and you can't be bothered parenting, so you just want to give, you're just giving the iPad back. That is very confusing for the child at any age, but especially in that zero to six space. Um, and it's the same, to me, that is the same as threatening when your kid's being really loud in the car, threatening to pull over and take, put them out of the car and then not doing that. You need to follow through on, and they need to have the natural consequence of whatever it is that you 
are putting forward. Um, so there is those two ways. I I had the two age different children, two different um, planes of development. Um, and because of the elder one, we needed to, to get more structure in what had happened um, with screen time just becoming quite ad hoc. Uh, so that was a decision that was sort of made in the school holidays um, is from now on, once school goes back, so this is a week before school holidays, once school goes back, uh, screen time is only going to be on the weekends um, for this, this and this reason. Um, and so there was warning and then each day, on that week leading up to school going back is just letting you guys know, do you remember that we spoke about iPads just being on the weekends? Um, you know, uh, we can have better engagement during the week, we're tired or whatever reasons that you, you're giving. But there was a time building up to that and there was communication and respect given to the children around it. Um, and it has been, it has worked brilliantly and I know that we uh, would be probably eight weeks into that um, and it has been, it has been great. Um, but it needed, it needed to be quite um, rigid um, and has been consistent. And so uh, you can make those two decisions. It's really case by case and how it is affecting your child or children. Uh, but whatever decision you make, be consistent in it and explain the why. How do you um, think children respond to apps such as Netflix where they have autoplay between episodes and an um, app, say, like ABC Kids? where you physically have to press play on the next thing. I know as an adult, Netflix is so much easier to watch because you can watch 10 episodes and you don't realise, however, my household likes when I watch one episode of something because then I can get up and do the, the, the jobs that are needed in the house. Do you think children are the same? So when we talk about autoplay in media, in digital media, um, it's there for a reason. A lot of it is convenience, a lot of it is it actually aids addiction to the device or to, to whatever it is that, uh, that it's on. Uh, so I think when we're looking at that, that from a, a child's perspective, I think we really need to, um, my, my instinct on that would be is that the not having autoplay available for children actually has them engaging and interacting in that space and, what, and, and having some type of control over what comes next for them. Uh, but I mean, YouTube, the general YouTube app will also play, have autoplay as well. Um, so there, you know, that has to come down to your own belief as a parent or an educator on what you think is best. In the ABC apps, in um, the YouTube uh, kids app, they have more interaction um, than say the adult type platforms where the autoplay is automatically there, um, which you know, can, we all know can waste hours of our time. Uh, whether you, but if you, we have more control as an adult. But that autoplay puts us onto autopilot. It is ten times worse for children. Uh, so really being aware um, of what we want, we want those children interacting with the device and making choice rather than being dictated to as much as possible.